This is your opportunity to be heard and to share your insights and expertise in the next edition. This is the first edition of the Connected Insights Web Summit, of course, but this is your opportunity to speak at the next edition of the, of the Web Summit. So that's all from me. Oh, yes. And in between the session, uh, uh, there is going to be a couple of times where we do quick photo opportunities. So we'll request you guys to just um, switch on your cameras for this brief time. And, uh, uh, you know, during that time, we'll take a quick photo um, to show the world that we met and we enjoyed this session. Um, so that's it from me. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Mads to do the introductions and start the workshop. Thank you once again, everyone. You'll hear me from me again during the discussion as a participant. Thank you so much, Varun, and welcome to all of you. My name is uh, Mats Winder, and uh, I'm so lucky that I've been working with sales for more than 25 years. But I was even more lucky uh, like five, six years ago when I met a lady called uh, Karina Bukdov, and she's one of the speakers today. And then later on, she introduced me to uh, a, a man called Bert Hasbrücke from uh, Belgium. And these two guys, I'm so lucky, guys and girls, I'm so lucky to have here today. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. But why is this so much luck for me? Because what I could see is for years, we have been running around thinking that sales is just something that we'll find out and either you are born for it or you'll never learn it. And that is by what I see now, one of the biggest mistakes because that's not right. Sales is not something you're just born for. There are different approaches to sales and we'll come back to that. And that was really where Karina wake me up and make me see that there are so many differences in sales. And also one of the things that are really strange for so many years, actually we're going back to the early 19th, then the marketing has been a scientific uh, thing you could work with. It was skills that you learned and you studied and during the years, it really grew up and, and marketing became with professors and, and PhDs and like that. But sales, that was something you had to find out yourself. You participated a course with somebody like me, and I've been a consultant for nearly 25 years. And what I did, I trained the sales people for one of two days. And what I also did was mistakenly learned them all the same skills. Karina shaked me up and showed me that this is not the truth about sales and we need to bring sales to a higher level of better understanding and more quality. That's why I'm so happy to have this workshop today. And just before handing over the word for a short introduction from Karina and Bert, I would like you all of you, please, in this digital world, find a pen and a paper. And there are two reasons for that. The first reason is that you think all of you that during this session will remember everything that is said. And I know, of course, maybe it's recorded and you get it, but you cannot remember. And we all know when Bert or Karina say something really valuable, oh, I'll have to remember, but you forget. So write down whatever question you get, bring it on if you want, put the notes down and do it a little analog with a pen and a paper. Secondly, I can really recommend you to do drawings, drawings of the figures that Bert and Karina will do. I will also very shortly go to this flip chart. Please write it down, draw it, because it's very good for your brain, because your remembrance will be better. Your memory will be better if you also draw it. And those of you who want to know more about how the brain works, then later during this week, I'll be speaking a little more about neuroscience sales, how it actually influences your brain. And that's just the start of it. Your brain learns better when you also do movements because of your senses, you adapt better to your memory. And by this, I really like to welcome Karina and Bert because we're gonna speak about what for me was a totally new field of selling, uh, co-creation. And then we're gonna dig into an old discipline that I really have seen in perspectives I never thought I could see, and that is segmentation, Bert. But first of all, Karina, can you do a short introduction and then we hand it over to Bert and then I'll be back. Yes, thank you so much for that introduction, Bert. Um, I'm just uh, going to show a quick uh, introduction slide of myself. 
but first of all, thank you so much for having me. I am very uh, excited about this opportunity. My name is uh, Karina Burgdorf, uh, and I am uh, working at the business school at Aalborg University in Denmark, where I am uh, responsible for uh, the education of, uh, of our students on the marketing and sales management master's degree. Other than that, I am affiliated at the Copenhagen Executive, which is Executive Education at Copenhagen Business School. I work at the University of Clermont-Ferrand in French as an external lecturer, and I am the manager of Creating Value Alliance. My research interest is particularly in how to do co-creation with customers in sales context, but also uh, how to manage organizations to make them mature enough to realize these co-creation opportunities. So I'm going to talk a lot more about co-creation and how to do that a little bit later, but uh, that was just shortly about me. Thank you so much again, Mas, for the introduction. I'm going to unshare. Yeah, and you hand, we hand it over to Bert. Thank you, Karina, and welcome. So also uh, from my end, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mats and uh, Varun, for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, I can uh, present uh, my research uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, so uh, thanks again. So a quick introduction about myself. So my name is Bert Pazbrugge. So born and raised in Belgium, uh, but now I'm uh, living in uh, Paris. Um, uh, I got my PhD in business economics uh, with a major focus on sales management in Belgium at the Belgian Business School. And it's actually this uh, research I will uh, tap into uh, later on. And as of today, I have uh, four uh, affiliations as a professor at uh, ESEC uh, School of Management in Paris, uh, Ghent University in Belgium, and then the Vrije Universiteit in uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And then uh, as well, uh, I also have an appointment at uh, Copenhagen Business School. So my uh, research uh, mainly focus on uh, the relationship uh, between buyers and sellers. So what I do is I usually, first of all, examine the needs of buyers and purchasers, and then uh, we make implications for sales and sales management. And since one year, I, uh, I found it an, uh, an application to really zoom in on those uh, needs of uh, major accounts, so key accounts, uh, uh, and it's called uh, VOCAM, so Voice of Customer in Key Account Management. And I'll just quickly share what I will talk about uh, later on uh, in my slides, uh, allowing me. Uh, uh, so uh, first of all, I will talk about uh, the evolution in buyer-seller relationships, and then. Uh, uh, match our sales approaches and our segmentation to uh, those purchasing needs uh, uh, in what we would call a purchaser-centric uh, segmentation. And uh, um, adding to the presentation of Karina, uh, uh, I will uh, guideline, guideline you uh, where co-creation actually makes uh, an added value for your customers. And of course, I will summarize it with uh, key takeaways uh, so I give the floor uh, back to to Mats uh, or Karina now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bert. And just shortly, what can you expect today? It's been said already, maybe that you can expect to get into the world of co-creation. And the world of co-creation is definitely what is co-creation and why is it so important? What is the benefit? And then definitely also how and if. Uh, how can you work with it and if you should do it uh, and the if is very important and we'll come back to that because it's not made for, for, for anybody in, in, in that sense and then we'll speak about segmentation and that really opened some of my eyes because it correlates really to co-creation because if you know your segmentation then you can work with the co-creation and your segmentation is prioritizing the way you approach your customers but also how you approach them so it's very interesting and we'll come back to that a little later. I'll just shortly go into uh, introducing now what actually happened when Karina 
asked me, what is sales? And I said to her, selling is somebody having a service or a product and you want somebody to buy it. Uh, and then she said to me, uh, Matt, if we talk about sales, are there different types of sales? And my natural was to speak about B2B and B2C and dealer sales and like that. I didn't understand that sales as a discipline had different perspectives until then. And then she asked me another question. Is running just running? And then I thought, no, of course, running is not just running because there is a difference between a 100 meter run, a 1000 meter run, a 10,000 meter run, a marathon or a hurdles run. They are so different and you never train them the same way. You don't make the same, make the same tactics. You, you practice them differently. And if you approach a marathon like a 100 meter runner, you will lose by sure. And if you approach a, a marathon, sorry, a 100 meter run like a, a marathon runner, you lose by sure. That is the same with sales. So just before I hand over to Karina, I'll just give a little perspective. What is sales actually? And, and how, do, how could we look upon it? First of all, we need to make some opposites. And please, when I do this, don't see this as bad or good. This is just way of ways of doing sales. And the first one is that we are on the far left and there's nothing political in this. On the far left, we have the transactional selling. Transactional meaning that in a very simple way, somebody has a product or service, somebody has some money and they wanna share. They wanna, they wanna give it to each other. That is the transaction. And there's nothing complicated and a lot of selling goes on that way. And a lot of selling is done very good in that way, that transactional way. Somebody expect that when you do transactional selling, you, you connect very close by relationship. But if it's really transactional, I'll give you an example. I don't know this example is not B2B, it's B2C. But try to imagine that you go into a Starbucks and you order a cafe latte. And that cafe latte is served by somebody by a name tag here saying that that guy was Paul. You enjoy the cafe latte and the day after you go into the same Starbucks. How many of you will ask directly for Paul to serve you with the coffee? Nobody, because you're not buying from Paul, you're buying from a brand, you're buying from the concept. And what you do is you do a transaction here. You pay money, you get a cafe latte. And actually you're buying, they didn't even sell to you. But the minute they start asking you, we also have a donut on the sale, you wanna buy that. Then they start selling. And this is the most simple way of selling that is the transactional selling. I'll come back to that in a minute. On the other side, we have something that we're gonna approach today, co-creation, or let's just talk also about very strong, very strong value creation. If we really go to the far right here on the co-creation, we are not focused on transaction, on product and money. Of course, we are still focusing on profit, earning money, but maybe we even have a purpose bigger than our own company to save the world, to do something good together. Varun started talking about the superhero project that is actually bigger than Consolidant or something else. Here we are actually co-creating by bringing something together and creating value bigger than just the short-term value. Of course, here you can still have a CSR perspective. You can still be wanting to do something good. But here, the sales approach is that it's not about what I can sell to you and you can sell to me. It's about what we can do together. These three main objectives actually gives a lot of ways into this. But three main objectives is here we will see a very focus on the product and value of, often is created in the product or the way you deliver your product, quick, easy. We see Amazon being a servant of products and that creates, of course, loyalty. But you don't know who you're speaking to with Amazon. You're, you're connecting to the system and the product is very focused on that product create value and very often price or speed is a very important thing. Very often serviced online because that's a natural thing to do when you're here. That is a challenge for the old, so to speak, salesperson, because here speed, price and convenience is more important. 
Then in the, in the middle, we go a little further and now we're going to speak about how solutions can actually bring products together in a bigger solution. Products and services together create a solution perspective. And here we are very focused on some of the classic skills in sales, understanding needs, creating amazing solutions that can cover needs. And of course, we want to create that value by doing really understanding the, the needs and presenting these solution in a way that clients say, you're amazing to do this solution. And maybe we even share some insights that give them a little more perspective. And then we go to the right. To the right, what we see now, and remember when I write down here, interaction, or I write down relationship, I'm not talking about that there's no relationship here, but relationship is very often connected to a system. Relationship here can be connected to the people I speak to, but here it's not only a matter of people, it's also a matter of purpose. It's also a matter of speaking together to see how we in this interaction can create more value than we could if we just have our products and solutions. And what I found out when I presented this is that a lot of salespeople always said to me, we are already going far to the right here. We are very interactional. We are co-creating, we are value creating. But every time when they talked about co-creation, I heard them say, how can I reach my budget? And the minute you say that word, you're already conflicting what the real sense and, uh, essence of, of co-creation is. And then suddenly one of my clients, they are doing a research, uh, sorry, search and selection, a very big staffing company. And then suddenly they were hit by something over in this site. They were called to one of the biggest clients. And in the room, there were five competitors together with this company that I work with and the company that all of them wanted to have as customers. And then this company, they would raise up, stood up and said to all the suppliers, we don't see you as suppliers. We see you as close connecting partners. And what we're going to do today is to make not even the best solution, but work on what will be best for the workforce if they have to come to us. And those of you sitting here expecting to have a bigger share of budget today, having a price discussion, you probably better leave the room now because today we're going to speak about how we can actually achieve some of the world sustainable development goals, how we can achieve more together. And this company came back to me and said, wow, we never tried to be in a room where competitors had to work together with those people that they actually deliver the solutions to and then together create something bigger than a simple solution. That was the first time some of my clients really heard what is value creation, co-creation. And I know sometimes if we go too far, it's really complicated for people. But today I'm so lucky that Karina will bring us into this world of co-creation and these perspectives that are far away from traditional selling, but still is very beneficial. And I know Karina, you'll take us into that world. So please welcome to you, Karina, and you take over from here to let us know more about the what, why, and the how of co-creation. Yes, thank you so much uh, again, Mas. Uh, I will uh, share my slides with you. Uh, <laughs> I hope you all see them now. We do. Good, good, good. And uh, I'm actually just going to um, pick up where you left off. Um, when we talk about value co-creation, in business to business context, which is what I'm going to be doing uh, today. Um, I just need to be able to click this. Um, we're going to go, we're going to go through why it's important. We talked a little bit about this match already, but I'm going to just elaborate a little bit on it. We're going to talk about how to do it. And of course, what is value co-creation? And the important part in this is actually understanding how a value co-creation process with customers is different from what you're already doing when you're building solutions with your customers, because it's not always the same thing. 
I'm also going to go through with you uh, the eight different types of co-creation processes that you can have with your customers. And I'm going to show you some examples. Um, so please feel free to ask questions as we go along. You can write them in the chat and, uh, and Les will pick up on them and, uh, and put them out and we'll go through them as we go along. Don't uh, hide your questions to the, to the end because as Matt said, I, I love to talk about this subject. It's so interesting that I'm probably going to use a little bit too much time anyway. So you might as well get your two cents in as soon as you need it. Good. So why is co-creation such a new thing? Well, or such an important thing. First of all, uh, following the changes in societies that um, that happened, uh, well, 20 years ago now, with the internet, with the increased globalization, uh, increase in technology, the old way of doing sales just isn't enough anymore to be able to be valuable as salespeople to the customers at hand. So the customers are now doing more and more of the buying process themselves. And, uh, and in order to, to be able to take value from a meeting with the customer, something else has to happen. Um, has to happen. And that could be value co-creation. Really, it has to be to do with the fact that we understand now that not all value is created equal. When Matt's talked about um, transactional sales, in that type of value creation, the value is, reside, is residing in the product. So you produce something, you put it to market, and then you decide what you want to earn on it, and then you go out and persuade your customers to buy it. So it's a very traditional way of doing selling. That type of sales will increasingly move towards automation. Um, and I know Beth is going to talk a lot more about that as we go along, because this has a lot to do with segmentation. But we need to understand that much like it is true in marketing, that you will not make the same marketing campaign and go push that out onto all your customers the same campaigns, the same messages, the same products, you will look at segments and understand that my customers are different and there's different types of customers out there that are in need of different things. So the same way we're going to be talking about sales today. Um, we need a more dynamic way of understanding sales, some, a more inclusive way to get the customers to understand more. So instead of having passive recipients of value, someone who can buy your product and then they can use it themselves and they're just targets for you to uh, turn to with your product and for you to gain market share. The customer will now become an active partner in creating something that is already there. Actually, one of the most important whys of this has shown to be the wicked problems. So we've all seen in the past 10 years Things happening in society, criticism and and uh, and some constructive ideas about how to improve capitalism, for example. Uh, we've all seen the SGDs moving forward. We have a lot of shared issues across the globe that we need to address. Uh, late <laughs> latest, uh, we had the COVID nineteen epidemic, showing us that sometimes wicked problems arise that we're all having to solve together. Actually, the companies working with co-creation have proven to have had record sales years in 2020. I'm going to say that again. The companies that are successful with co-creation in selling and have been that way before the COVID-19 crisis, majority of them had their record selling years last year. Why? Well, because they already had learned to involve different stakeholders, to be very agile and to work with customers instead of targeting them. That would make their, co their companies much more sustainable and much more resilient to wicked problems from society. So COVID-19 is also 
uh, very important. One of the things that you need to understand, though, is that co-creation is not something you can do with everybody all the time. This is something you do with some select customers in special contexts, simply because what I'm, I'm going to be talking about today with co-creation of value is something that takes a lot of energy and resources from your organization. And it's not always the right thing to do for the customer either. I'm going to leave the part of who to do it with and when to Beth, because that's his speciality. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, not step too much in on that. Yes. But just to sum it up, co-creation of value with customer is going to be necessary for company because we support. Yes. I have I hear I have someone on the line. I don't know if that's that that. you have a question or is it just somebody not muted? I think okay. it was somebody unmuted. Someone not muted. So let's get into uh, the what of uh, of co-creation. So co-creation is not necessarily something that is only a sales methodology. It is in the context we're going to be talking about it today, but it's also a way of doing something with somebody. So co-creation in selling is a specific way of attacking the sales meeting or the sales process that is different from what we usually did. In usual sales processes, we would start out by, uh, of course, doing some research. We would uh, have the initial contacts. Then we would have some type of a situational um, dialogue or interaction, trying to figure out what's the problem, um, doing some needs analysis. Then we would present a solution and move into closing phases and then after sales. Pretty much every sales methodology that you know of would follow those steps. And it would look very much the same if it was a B2B or a B2C context. Some things might be easier in a B2C context just because fewer people are involved. Uh, but when we're moving into co-creation, we need to start thinking completely different about that process. That starts by understanding what is co-creation. So this um, model I have here, actually I use it a lot, uh, but I haven't been able to find a source for it. I actually think it's someone who did it from a, a practical example at one time, but it, it very much uh, delivers a good framework for understanding. There's two axes actually. One is ownership, because ownership is important to understanding co-creation. One of the issues in co-creation, to be very honest, is that if you deliver and develop something with your customers, who owns it? Uh, is it something we own together? Should the customers still pay? Uh, the answer is, of course, yes, uh, but not in the way you think. <laughs> and uh, but also to to make sure that um, uh, that you understand where is the focal point of uh the ideas that are that are emerging from the co-creation process the other one is openness and if you look at the first uh the first uh the first matrix here on the bottom it says club of experts right so that's where you will be talking ab about co-creation processes that is an invites only uh type of co-creation process that might be very similar to what you do in most business-to-business-driven uh, -business co-creation processes. You wouldn't necessarily make an open invitation for everybody to join. That could happen. But you would probably sit down and have an idea about who to invite in the first place. And then you would take those companies and people in uh, to work on it. On the other way, um, on the other axis, you would look at, is it only the initiator? So if my company is hosting a co-creation process, do we own the rights of everything that is built? That would also be very much uh, something that is seen in a business to business context. So the club of experts would be a company inviting selected people to join and keeping ownership of the co-creation process. This is particularly good if you're looking to uh, develop or further develop something very concrete that you might have 
a special resources to, or you already have data to understand uh, how to solve this problem, or if you have uh, a very good idea of what you want, want to do and who you want to do it with. On the, uh, on the other axis, on the top of that, um, you can open up the process. Uh, and I'm going to give you examples of this uh, a little bit later, but you can invite everybody to join. And I actually have one example of just that happening that I'm going to share with you later, where you say, we, I still own the process and I'm going to keep the ownership of how we go about this and everything that comes out of it. But we, we are sending out open invitations for everybody who's interested. If you move uh, a little bit further uh, to the other side, you can say, well, we still have a select invitation only uh, membership, but we are now sharing uh, any contributions or uh, products or innovations that are coming out of this. This complicates things a little bit. If you have to share a right and, uh, and ownership, of course, but it is very doable or uh, typically not as much for products and services, but more for ideas. And um, if you form societies, I'm going to show you how that looks like in a little bit. Uh, and then finally, on top of that, you would have the community of kindred spirits that would typically be very loosely connected and not something that you have particular ownership of. That would be something that will um, work in itself. A very good example of that is actually what Matt just talked about before, which is Starbucks. Starbucks do have innovation in this. Uh, they do uh, innovation and, uh, and different community projects so that they will support uh, local communities in creating some type of shared value around uh, the block where, the, where they have their stores. Uh, but Starbucks really doesn't own this process. This is something owned by the people participating and they're just contributing into it and using it for marketing purposes. So you can do different types of um, different types of value co-creation. One is crowdsourcing, which would be uh, the community uh, type uh, approach uh, where you uh, simply send out an idea and ask people to contribute in, uh, in separate ways. You can do mass customization, which is something that Nike, for example, has have had a lot of things to do with. Both of these, by the way, are very much uh, things that are best suited for business to consumers. So I'm not going to go that much into it. But Nike, for example, will help you design your own shoes. So you can get the mold and you can get the idea, but then you can customize to yourself, help co-create the value around your running shoes. Um, they also have a, run a running app you can use. You can uh, join the community uh, and you can compete against other people, see which way to go for a run in Dubai if you're not necessarily from there. Um, you can do peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, this happens, by the way, sometimes without the company being able to monitor or control or, uh, or even influence how the peer-to-peer -peer networks work. Lego is a very good example of someone who, do who does this uh, very successfully. They create forums and networks for people that are using the Lego platforms for everything and then make it accessible for them to talk to each other and innovate. And then they kind of get the innovations from that place. You can, oh, I'm sorry, there's a mistake, a typo. It's supposed to say shared resources. You can pull your resources together in different uh, and use them to solve problems um, together with other uh, companies. This is what uh, is called shared value creation. An example would be the COVID-19 situation in Alberg, where I'm from, a lot of the businesses, a lot of small businesses were hurting, uh, probably the same in your communities around the world as well. Businesses were closed because of lockdown, uh, restaurants were closing down and they were soaring and, and having a hard time making ends meet. The municipality and the people of the city and uh, the uh, business networks and the restaurants and the shops went together and created a shared online platform 
for people to buy easily easily and have people have you know different um products and takeouts not just takeout for food but takeout for you know clothes and everything else brought home to people to create a, a sort of situation where we could keep all the businesses afloat so the municipality the municipality was actually a very big part of that giving money to it using their platforms to communicate to every citizen in, in the world the, the businesses would create would the deliver marketing resources the municipality would pay some money but they would also make um as i said uh, all the citizens email addresses accessible so they were kind of pulling all the resources to create something together to avoid uh, being hurt by this uh, bad bad situation which uh, kind of worked then you have open innovation uh, which, uh, of course, is something that a lot of companies have been working with, especially within the IT industry. This has been something that's been going on for a lot of years. Um, you would uh, present uh, customers with a product and ask them to further develop that. Um, there's joint ideation, uh, where you, you sit down with a wicked problem, for example, and you get ideas about how to solve it um and then lastly uh, a lot of b2b companies that have very complex products you would invite people to join invite other companies to join to see how can i uh look how can we innovate further and how can you use this so important for all of this and the shared um the common thread through all of this is that in every situation, it's not about the product that you have. It's not about the resource that you have. It's not about the idea that you have. It is about improving the everyday processes of the customers that you have. It's about improving the everyday processes of your customers. So if your customers are business customers, what are they aiming to to achieve if they are consumers what is the aim that th that that consumer is trying to achieve you need to figure out how you by one of these processes can help them achieve their goals quicker or better or how you can somehow help them um make their meet, meet their results this is inherently different than understanding that there's a problem somewhere in the process so in a traditional sale and this is very important you would go in and you would say what are the type of challenges you're facing right now uh what is your uh, current situation uh, how can we help you solve this particular problem this particular place in time and space to make sure that you don't have it anymore and how can we help you solve that and then you typically already have some type of module or service that you can apply to make that happen in a co-creation process you would look further into the everyday processes saying this problem is part of a lot of different processes that goes to a specific specific goal or specific strategy or something that you need to achieve and we are now taking the co-responsibility of helping you move along we might not have all the resources ourselves so we will invite our network the customers stakeholders broadly into the process to help you achieve this so how can we help improve the everyday processes of our customers to achieve their goals. And just to be very clear about it, no customer wakes up thinking that their goal is for you to sell more. So if the answer is uh, we need to increase market share, then you're probably already straying a little bit. What you need to ask yourself is how can I help my customers achieve more? How can I help my customers increase their market share or to improve what they're doing um, which is very much different so it's all about the customer's success yes 
The last one is product as a service. I forgot to put that on there because that's really what I was talking about. But product as a service is, um, is when you take a simple product that might be that cup of coffee and then you put it into a context of the everyday process. Very good example of that is actually uh, from another co coffee company that I worked with. Uh, they sell coffee machines, vending coffee machines for um, for for companies. You know, it's a B two B company, and you could they could choose to do a transaction. Say, we just want to sell you some coffee, uh, and uh, we have these types of coffee. Uh, these types of co coffee sorts, I don't know what it's called. Um, you could buy so many, then it costs so much, uh, and we can give you maybe a discount. Who knows if you buy a lot at a time? Or they could say, well, we also want to do a service on the machine that you do. We can come and clean it. We can make sure that it's stationed the right places in the office where people are. Uh, we want to make sure that you have also tea available because I mean, not everybody drinks coffee. Maybe we wanna do a little uh, coffee station for you with everything that, that you can do there. Um, so that would be the solution type of sales. If you were to do co-creation, you would have to start a completely different place. You would have to start looking at how is coffee playing a role in the everyday process of your customer. So what we did here was actually do a workshop with we did uh, the very uh, selective process and we kept ownership just to be sure so this was the cup of expert experts we invited people in that were customers and potential customers and someone who even left the company to to do something else we invited people who were experts in coffee and different types of, uh, of people that we saw fit to talk to about this and then we posed a question to the group asking why do we even have coffee in businesses? Why is it important to have a coffee stand or to make coffee available for your for for your employees and and everybody there? I mean, water is so much cheaper, uh, at least in Denmark, because that's where we were in. And just to put this into context, in Denmark we have so great water that we can drink it from the tap, so it's basically free. Um, and um, so why don't just do that? You can save a lot of money by, you know, taking the coffee out of it. Uh, and uh, it's probably much healthier in the end. And the customers started to complain saying, well, you can't do that because, you know, if you have meetings, you have to have coffee because coffee is a very big social part of the meeting. Uh, actually, uh, there's some research uh, suggesting that there's a very uh, high likelihood that if you turn down coffee, your sale is not going to, the likelihood of sale goes down. So this is how much coffee is a part of the way we do sales in Denmark. If you say, no, thank you, I'd rather have water, then you're already losing points. Another type of uh, situation where coffee is really important is for the breaks. Once you take a break for as an employee, and a very good way of doing that is to have something else to do. So going to grab a cup of coffee, talking to your, your, your co-workers is also a ritual. So what we wanted to do there is understand how can we improve the rituals of meetings and of coffee breaks and then make them better. And then, oh, by the way, the coffee is a very big part of that. So they started doing innovation about how to make better meetings, how to make better coffee, uh, coffee breaks. And in that process, increased their market share by 17% in the Danish market. And by the way, when you're buying coffee as a business, do you want to buy it from someone who's just selling coffee or someone who helps you make better meetings and better uh, coffee breaks. I would go with the latter. So this is about co-creation. They took the product and moved it into a service and made it into something that would improve the everyday processes of the customer. I hope, uh, can, I, can, I, can I just see you in the chat for a second? Can you uh, just, is this making sense to everybody? Am I explaining it good enough? Um, 
just let me know. Yeah, good. Someone is writing. Good. I just because I I love the feedback because I need to understand if you're all following here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, it's always nice to see that. Good. Yeah. So what I want you to uh, to discuss, everybody, I'm just going to send you out in uh, some breakout rooms just for a couple of minutes, because this, this was like my preliminary example, and I promise I will give you more. Uh, but I need you to discuss with each other if you I have... Mean, I'm, I'm not sure we can do the breakout sessions. We can't do the breakout sessions? Kanika, we cannot, right? We can't do it? No. Um, I think we can discuss in this room because the breakout sessions, they're not oh, uh, working. They don't work. Yeah. They don't work? Okay, no. so breakout sessions don't... Yeah, let's have a coffee break, someone said. What I think uh, we should do then is, uh, is probably... Um, just in this session, maybe you can you can uh, raise your hand. Can, Mess, can you uh, can you control it then? Who wants to talk? Yes, who wants to yes, speak? yes, sure. I'm just asking you to give me some short examples of where you experience this type of co-creation, if ever, in uh, in a business to business situation. We heard you, so I think they're just thinking, Karina. Um, I I can start if that's okay. Please. Yes, yeah. please. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, this is something that we do sort of day in and day out at Consolidon, okay? Uh, which is, uh, we, sorry, I'm going to close my window as well while I speak. Uh, too much uh, background noise otherwise. Um, so what we do is uh, we co-create with a lot of boutique consulting firms. Uh, this summit is a great example, right? Uh, you know, there's 70 plus boutique consulting firms uh, trying to co-create uh, this web summit, right? Uh, and they're, yes, they're our partners, but they're in a way our customers as well. And we found that, um, you know, we were approaching them very differently a few years back, right? Where we were approaching very differently with them as, just partners and not necessarily co-creators, right? Um, and that's changed uh, actually after COVID, right? When uh, necessity hit, uh, we started focusing a lot more on co-creation with our boutique consulting firms. Yeah. That's a quick example if that's okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, um, if anyone else has, uh, an example, I would welcome that. Otherwise, I'll just move along and show you mine. It's very important, though, to uh, to be um, to be aware of that moving your product into the everyday process of the customer part. So, if you're inviting the customer into your business to do some type of um, a process, then that's not co-creation selling. It might be co-creation as a way of doing a process of innovation, but it's not co-creation selling. A lot of companies confuse the fact, uh, well, the way of uh, confuse co-creation selling with, um, with actually with user innovation. So, uh, you would, for example, get an idea, you would uh, then develop a product and then you would invite certain customers or stakeholders in and have them check out what you've done and then come up with uh, some different ideas for adjustments or customization. That is not co-creation selling. That is you getting feedback on modules or uh, products or something in a solution selling or value selling context. It's not bad. It's just not co-creation selling. And it's as Matt said in the beginning, it's very important to understand that there is no good and bad in this. It's just different. And you need to understand that when you do co-creation, you do it in the right way. Um, so be wary of the fact that you have to 
move into the process of the everyday processes of the customer, but also that moving the customer into your everyday processes of innovation or uh, production is not the same thing. That is user uh, innovation, which is also something very important for a lot of companies, but not the same thing. Yes. Okay, let's move along. So now that we heard a little bit about what value co-creation is, uh, I'm gonna uh, talk to you a little bit about how to do it. Well, traditional sales processes would be very linear. Uh, you get a, in contact with a person or maybe a couple of people inside your buying, your buying a company, your customer company, a potential customer. And then you will go through a process of, you know, of contact, of needs identification, of a solution presenting, of making an offer, of closing, of delivering. You go through this process and sometimes you'd go a little bit back and forth. But to be very honest, it would be a very linear process and you would have people moving along this uh, very strict uh, way of doing the sales. This is, by the way, uh, very much uh, visible in the CRM systems that we all use because they're built from this process, right? Um, now, co-creation is something that involves a lot more stakeholders and that is a lot less linear. So we are talking about creating value through ecosystems. And ecosystems in uh, in sales, in purpose sales or co-creation sales is actually uh, the key to realizing the potential that you might have. How big is the ecosystem? Well, if you have, remember the model before, very open uh, access to everybody and it's a peer-to-peer -peer community, the ecosystem can potentially be extremely huge, but it could also be an invite-only ecosystem. So a network of people that are connected in different ways. It's very important to understand that it's not just a one-way connection. So earlier you would have a salesperson who would be in contact with a couple of people and then the salesperson, the, the, the purchaser would have different types of systems that they would go into and access by themselves. Now it's a lot more like this picture. It's a lot more confused and you're in contact with different types of people all the time. What's important is that you understand how to learn to manage it. And what you, what you move to do is to move from managing a person or a certain relationship to managing a process. So in solution and relationship selling, you would, you would manage the relationship and nourish that. In purpose or co-creation sales, you manage and nourish a process of going through some steps and then people can opt in and opt out. So let's go a little bit deeper to that. So you have to connect and manage the ecosystem. To do that, you have to adhere to some certain rules that apply. And this is from uh, the 81 companies I tested this in, different industries. So it's always purpose be before profit. This is very important. As I said before, no customer ever wakes up saying, my purpose today is to make my suppliers rich. So what they will adhere to is something else. Uh, Unilever, for example, which is a major company, has a very strict goal of being completely CO2 neutral in 2025. So if you can somehow help them achieve that goal, they will definitely be on board. That's more important than making a profit, even to Unilever themselves. So it's not always either we can help our customers make a profit, because to some customers, the profit is not necessarily the first goal either, or the only one. So purpose be before profits. Then uh, you involve stakeholders across all sectors, sometimes even competitors. So you have to be open to involve different types of stakeholders than what you would usually do. So 
you may be involving your customer's customer, maybe some experts, maybe uh, competitors. There's a lot of different, uh, you know, stakeholders that are relevant more than just the one buying and the one selling and maybe uh, someone uh, with some specific knowledge in between. By the way, Matt, you let me know when my time is about up, right? I'll let you know 10 minutes before. Good, 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 good. So this process of co-creation has to do with continuous management of the ecosystem. And I'm going to give you systems of it. And then it's all about the law of reciprocity. I don't know how many of you are, uh, are actually uh, familiar with uh, the great professor Gialdini from uh, Italy, who studied uh, uh, the laws of, um, uh, well, psych psychological laws of how we interact as, as people. And one of the universal laws that exists across from every culture is the law of reciprocity. The law of reciprocity states that if you get something from someone, you will feel morally and, and you will feel morally obliged to give something back. This is, by the way, why lobbying is such a great idea for politicians or for companies trying to uh, help politicians. I mean, I know they're trying to say that I'm totally independent of, uh, of any uh, contributions I might get as a politician. But I mean, psych biology even and psychology will say that it's. Karina, you have a little problem with your, your sound. I don't know if it's the connection or the microphone, but. Uh, yes, what about now? Now it's better. Good. So, as I said, the law of reciprocity is actually stating that if you get something from someone, you will feel obliged to give something back. This has to do with the, the way that human uh, society developed way back in history. So, when we were hunters and gatherers, um, I would, it would be the, the, the communities that were able to share their food and what they gathered, their hunting gains with each other survived better than communities that would keep everything to themselves individually. It makes sense, right? So if someone goes out and, and shoots a giant mammoth or buffalo and, and shoot, you know, with arrows. I know they didn't have guns at that time. As maybe a, a small family wouldn't probably be able to eat all of that themselves. But then again, if they did not have any idea that if I share this with my neighbor, if I share it with Nasser's family, then when next time when they have food and I don't have any, I would get it back then my natural instinct would to be to protect my own. So over time, we nourish the, the psychological tendency to share with each other in the premise of giving back. You all know this too. If someone gives you a gift, you, uh, it, you know, um, for your birthday or for the holidays, and you didn't buy anything to give them back, it might even feel a little bit uncomfortable. So this is what is happening in the ecosystems as well. If you provide stuff to your customers and if you help your customers succeed, they will biologically and psychologically be, feel, um, feel like they owe you something and that would put you in a good position. Yes. So... I'm just going to take you through the process and I'm, then I'm going to give you some examples of how this works. This is the process that I built. I work with uh, 81 companies in Denmark that were, some of them were doing co-creation already. Um, I'm a social scientist, so it's very important for you to understand that I didn't make this up. I look at how companies that were already succeeding in co-creation were doing it. And then I found the patterns across from different industries. These are all B2B, by the way. Uh, and then once I kind of mapped the process, I retested it in 11 B2B companies to make sure 
that the process I found would be able to work in different contexts. So, um, uh, yeah, and, and an important part of this is actually I found out that sustainability is a side effect of doing uh, co-creation, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, the first step is the one on top. It's all about gaining insights into your customers, industries, and your main challenges. So this is not something new. What is new is that we do have a lot more technological ways to collect data and to be with customers. Um, so you need to understand what is going on with my customers. The closer you can get to your customer, the better it is. So assuming that you know what your customers want is not good enough, but what type of data, hardcore data can you collect that might show possibilities or challenges in a certain industry. The second one is about, well, the, the arrow here is where you invite people to join. You in, then invite your, uh, your select uh, industry people or customers, and then together you map your resources and your goals. So that would be inviting, for example, to a workshop, asking everybody, what are your goals adhering to this challenge or this possibility in the market? And what type of resources do you bring to the table? Usually it's not allowed to be money. Um, so if you ask customers to participate, you shouldn't ask them to pay for it. Because if you do that, you, um, you actually, they, they buy a product, they buy the workshop, and then they want something in return from that particular workshop. You should instead ask them to bring something else, resources like time, people, uh, products, whatever else you have. Uh, because every time you, you have that transaction, the customer has a legitimate uh, expectation that they will get something right back and output right away. Then you create uh, from, from mapping your resources and your goals, and, and it looks very very much like a, a post-it session, right? You put in, I have these things that I can offer. Uh, I have time, I have this money, I have these resources, I have this data, and this is what I wanna achieve. And then once you have a whole wall of what people are contributing or what company are, companies are contributing and what they want out of it, then you can start to find out what type of platform should we create together. A platform could be something technical, a digital platform, it could be an event, it could be um, an innovation product uh, or project, it could be uh, it could be basically anything. So platform here is, is really the most open word uh, possible. Um, then from that platform, if it's an innovation of a new product, then you start building a new culture, you start finding out how do we work together across companies? How do our innovation departments work together? Um, if it's, uh, if it's uh, an event, you start planning the event. Um, and then after you go through that, you evaluate, of course, what happens. And let me just show you what it looks like for a couple of the companies I work with. The first one uh, is actually a small business uh, called Kruse Vesk. Uh, it, it means, uh, Kruse is a name and it means laundry. So this is a very good example of a very non-sexy business. Um, it's a family owned industrial laundry. They have uh, existed for 56 years and they operate in a very mature and saturated market. So the laundry uh, market, industrial laundry market is very much uh, influenced by the fact that there are, at least in Denmark where they were situated, some very large players that are industrial uh, at a very large scale and that are international. So they had like probably two large, large competitors that were very good at competing on price because of their very big, their very big uh, production facilities, right? Um, so they were the smallest amongst all these large competitors in the Danish market. What they actually do is that they rent out linens, tablecloths napkins, bedding, chef, chef's coatings, and everything to restaurants and hotels. 
and different production companies so that the way that so that restaurants and the hotels can focus in on their core uh, which is hosting guests giving food you know <laughs> making food and doing their stuff um and that's to be very honest uh, a, a type of uh, competitor situation that is a little bit um that it that's red ocean to be very honest with you there's uh, very little difference between which type of napkin you get. It's not like uh, you get very many complaints in your hotels about the linens, unless they're dirty and, and I mean, they are washing them in, you know, in all of these competitors. So it's more uh, if you have this or that type of tablecloth or this or that type of linens, it's really not something that's very easy to compete on. So we went into this process thinking we wanted to achieve we want to improve the sales process and move this type of sales away from transactional sales into co-creation we wanted to create something that would differentiate this company from their competitors because they all deliver the same products and services and then we wanted to move away from price wars uh, because the way it, it was working was that once a year they came out to renegotiate the contract. Someone would say, the customer would say, well, we have had an offer from one of the larger companies. They could cut 5%. Would you be willing to do the same to keep us as a customer? Very unproductive way of, of doing sales. Um, and then they wanted to develop a unique value proposition, something that was very valuable to the customers without uh, actually... Um, changing the core of it yeah so how do we go to practice value creation processes and i'm just gonna yeah and the goal was also to increase customer loyalty because basically they weren't they were loyal only to price so the first picture here i just need to tell you the story about this because this is a picture of of uh, the chefs of some of the largest and best restaurants in this area and they are now plating the dessert for one of the company one of the restaurants in a competition this is very i don't know how many of you are familiar with chefs i know beth is so he can maybe approve that i'm telling the truth typically very competitive uh as people uh, but they are actually all here helping to present and plate the, the in a competition, their competitors plate because they realize that if one of them, if they all make good impressions, then the whole industry would be lifted. I'm going to give you the background now. So the first part was... Rina, you got 12 minutes, my dear. Yes. The first way of working was to um, actually map out the problem of the industry. Um, and one of the th ways of doing this was to collect data. And we decided to collect data uh, in some of these instances a little bit unusually. So we sent out the CEO, the production manager, washing laundry company to work with their customers. So we had them turn out in the restaurant saying, can I help set the tables? Can I help, uh, you know, marinate chicken? Can I help uh, clean rooms at the hotels? And the insights they gained there were astonishing because you would think that they would know already what, it, what was very important to the customers because they've been asking the customers for years. But what happened was that they got to see some of the tacit knowledge that is layered in the way that you do business. They got to see for themselves what are the everyday processes of the customers that we're trying to improve. And when you talk to customers, they tend to focus on what is the problems? What do we want to achieve? Remember, that's the solution sales way of doing things. You, you solve a problem, you try to uh, make them achieve a certain goal. But when you move to co-creation, you want to improve the everyday processes. So inserting yourself into these processes is one way of doing it. So what they learned, for example, is that the way they packaged the linens could be much more efficient if they just 
did it a little if they just packaged them a little bit, a bit differently for the old maids that were working in the hotels they also understood they thought for years for 56 years they thought that price was the most important element for the business for the restaurants when choosing who their supplier was in linens but actually having your supplies delivered at a very specific time is much more important to restaurants because you can't do service if you don't have your linens at the precise right time. So after that, they started out mapping saying, what is it that are common, common issues in the everyday processes of these restaurants? What is it that they want to contribute that is not money? And what is it that they want to achieve? So these hotels, and restaurants, specifically the restaurants, they said, well, we have a very bad situation in this uh, part of the country that this company is situated is, that is that we have not a very high quality of food uh, and people are, you know, not willing to pay enough to have us deliver high quality restaurant experiences. We want to change that in some way. Um, so, then we went on to create uh, what it, the NM, which is called, it's, uh, and it doesn't make sense to put it in English anyway, it's a food festival. You see it here, it's the very first year. These are small gourmet uh, things you can purchase from each restaurant that is in the middle of the center. The, what you saw before the picture of all the chefs working together is all the great restaurants making gourmet food and they are all uh, in a competition to win the best dish of the year, but they help plate with each other because they understand that everybody coming, if they see all the great gourmet food, then they would be more willing to go to the restaurants. And actually this project started six years ago. And today this small city that I'm living in has two Michelin mentions and has turned from being a very a, a, a city with very low quality of food to actually be a gourmet mecca um, of a sorts. Uh, so something happened. And then sustainability happened uh, by accident because what also turned up was the fact that most of these um, restaurants really wanted to do something uh, with local produce, they wanted to make sure that they uh, had a, an eco-friendly way of working. So they, they suggested that the laundry started taking the old tablecloths that were too worn to be used anymore to, to serve food on them and make them into aprons for uh, the chefs to work in so that you can prolong that. Um, the hotel suggested that you could send um, used sheet, linens or sheets and pillowcases to, um, to, to homes, you know, for uh, battered women or to orphanages uh, and stuff like that. So they actually helped um, help the business grow. Uh, Five more minutes, Karina. Yeah. By the way, uh, this company uh went from having had 15 years of uh, just balancing uh, their books to having record years in uh within two years they turned over a large profit and i just want to tell you this as a very last thing um when COVID hit this company was obviously hit as well because all of their customers closed down, the restaurants, the hotels, but they already had this way of working co-creation so close to the way, the core of working that they could easily readjust. So what they did was they pulled all these companies together, all of their clients. They said, what is the main issue right now? The issue is that we're not open. We can't sell anything. And, uh, and then they created a new platform for people staying at home so that you can have food made because you're busy taking care of your children, you know, the everyday processes of the everyday citizen in the, in, 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 in the area. 
and uh, you could have food from home takeout, but at the same time, you could take and put out your linens, your personal linens, and your towels as a, as a person, and then the restaurant would take it back to the restaurant. They would wash it at the laundromat, and next time you order takeout, they would put it back. So they actually managed to help the restaurants achieve uh, more sales because you have to buy takeout twice to get this offer from the same restaurant, but they also managed to uh, actually keep production up for themselves. So uh, I did have another example, but as, um, as Matt said, uh, I just, uh, I got a little carried away with the everything else. But what I wanna show you here is, um, oh, is uh, the results of this. Across from all the companies, we had an increase of uh, customer retention. So customers stopped switching. So we kept more customers. We had an increase in efficiency uh, because we started, we, we didn't spend a lot of resources developing things that customers didn't want anyway. And we had an increase in revenue. So all of the companies that we worked with actually increased revenue uh, every single one. And the last part may be also important uh, is uh, they turned, switched information from outside, no, inside out to outside in. And then these are examples of uh, new projects that we're still working on uh, with the SGD in purpose, be, be, SGDs as the main purpose, because if you do not know what to choose as the common thing that you can improve in the everyday processes of your customers. A very good way of starting out with your first co-creation product is to choose one of the things that affect everybody on the planet. And maybe, just maybe, uh, UN gave you the 17 best sales arguments in the world when they made this for you. So uh, you could start out by saying, how can we help uh, reduce uh, gender uh, inequality, for example? Um, I have a, a pension company who is trying to do that just that through pension uh, agreements with customers. So um, I hope this gave you some idea of what co-creation is and how you can use it. Uh, I'm willing to take all the questions that you have in and all the in all the time that I'm allowed to use for so that. So please bring up if you have some questions or comments, and then if not, I I might have a couple of questions. Yeah, and please feel free to uh, connect on LinkedIn if you have anything else, or uh, and I would be happy to share my slides as well. Of course. I think Karina, if 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 you could. Sometimes even even I that I've known you for for years, I get a little confused when it's when it's uh, value creation and when it's just trying to be customer centric. Uh, can you just point out maybe the two biggest differences? I, I think I know them about profit or not profit, but can you can you just point out the two biggest difference yeah. about uh, being customer centric or being co grading? Yeah. So. Being customer centric is putting the customer first or in the middle of everything you do. So when you're working in a customer centric way, you would, you would actually uh, work from the customer's perspective. Um, whereas when you do co-creation, you work from a joint purpose, something that you have in common that you want to improve. So that's the one thing is that it has to be a shared goal or something that you want to achieve both of you in co-creation, whereas customer centricity is all about the customer. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is uh, the way of doing it. Uh, co-creation is not necessarily customer centric, it's purpose centric. It's about achieving uh, something that uh, lies outside of the realm of just one customer. Um, so, um, it's less context specific and more purpose specific. 
So you would have more stakeholders that are relevant to the process if you work in co-creation than you would have in a customer-centric perspective. Yes. I think now, now we had our Dubravko who was uh, from, from the tourist part. And I think really, if you look at, at, at an area like it could be Dubai, it could be Northern part of Jutland. If, if we are able to co-create how we can be an amazing place for tourists and forget just about our own profit, then we can develop some, something really amazing uh, in the tourist business as well, right? Yeah. I, actually, the tourism industry is a, a place of great potential because if you understand the processes of, um, of the end consumer even, they, what they want is have a great experience with the customer journey throughout. Um, so if we can bring hotels, bars, uh, restaurants, uh, attractions, uh, municipalities in Dubai, for example, together to understand how can we make this a place of uh, of particular interest to certain segments. Mauritius actually did that very successfully. I, yes. I don't know if you're in tourism, you would know that Mauritius actually chose that they would not want to be a destination for everybody. They want to be what they call a honeymoon or special guest. Uh, place to be. It should be once in a lifetime. They particularly designed this whole co-creation process on the island around making it so expensive that, that only few people can come. And when they come, they can only come once in a lifetime. I think also if, if you look at the health industry, now I, I heard we had somebody from Samsung, I heard, uh, and, your, and your dear friend and colleague, uh, Regis Lemons, he, he uh, had some projects where, where um, uh, medical suppliers or uh, IT companies could go together with hospitals and, and data and purpose of better health, it's actually the, the purpose, right? Yeah, well, actually what they did was similar to the, you know, you have the, health trackers, bracelets, or watches, or what you have, and uh, and the data you collect from uh, moving around and how you work, you can use that co combined with data from hospitals, with data from um, uh, from every you know other player in the health industry, and then you can start to predict when someone is at risk for maybe heart disease or having a heart attack or having an epileptic seizure, which was the case with this, so that you can use your trackers, not just to stay healthy, but to avoid getting sick. Because what the health tracker does in the end of, you know, in the everyday process of the individual that wears it, is to help you live a sustainable, healthy lifestyle. So how can we help you with that? It, other than just, um, and reminding you to drink water, but can we help you see that now you're actually having a seizure in a little while, or you need to go to the doctor because your blood rate has been too low, or your heart rate has been too low for a couple of days? I think what, what is really interesting here is, uh, we have some, if, if people haven't heard about, unfortunately, we, have, we don't have the time now, but if people haven't heard about the, the, the conscious capitalism, you can say this really sticks also to, to co-creation or purpose creation, yeah. because conscious capitalism means that you, you lower the attention to your profit and maximizes the attention to what you can create in your community or for these kind of people and, and together, right? That's absolutely true. So you, 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 you move from a place of doing business where you say, as long as we don't harm nobody, we can make all the profit we want. And then you move into a new paradigm saying, we actually want to do good for all of society, yeah. for all of our stakeholders, not just not harming, but we want to be a force of good. And yeah. the, the, the interesting part is that in the long run, everything that we now know suggests that that is the way to make more profits. Exactly. But, but it's, it's on a long scale long term so you have to be patient about it so now you're actually addressing the main topic here the main thing to be aware of in in your management perspective in your strategy perspective you need to change your mindset to be not so short term uh, profit oriented but more long-term sustainable and actually that's i see that these companies that really take the sdgs and want to do something with those they're gonna 
be very strong in the future if they really mean it uh, and, and not just greenwashing about it or whatever it is. Mm. So I think that's uh, for the SDGs, it's very, very interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting for everything because the SDGs is just one other indicator that we're moving towards a different way of thinking and doing society. So this way of, of, of working with strategic um, uh, strategic doing good, you know, that creating value or shared value is actually something that is, um, is going to be needed for everybody. Yes. We're right now going up a curve. More and more companies are adopting the SDGs. And at some point, we're going to reach the point where the majority have done so. And the people that, the companies that are not, you know, that haven't done it yet are going to start drop off and be challenged by that competitively. Perfect. Karina, we've got a question. Uh, and the question is, how is the difference? How, how does it difference from social selling? Uh, yeah. I think it's... Yeah, social different. selling is a... And, and thank you so much for this question. Uh, social selling is, uh, is something that is also confused with being social. But social selling actually is uh, a very strict discipline that, work, that has to do with sales through social media. So, um, so that's a specific way of selling that is linked very strongly to a certain type of media. Yes. So, whereas co-creation is something that can take place across different uh, types of channels. Yeah. Perfect. So you can actually use social selling also to support your. your oh yeah, we highly recommend it. Yes. Definitely. Okay. I think uh, if no more questions, I'll not just. Uh, I hope, yeah, I got a question. No, it's answered, yes. Uh, Varun, you have a question? Uh, no, I want to take a photo now. Oh, yeah, you, you want to take photos. So you want everybody to go on the, on, the, uh, on the webcam, please. Please put on your yes. cams. And while Varun is getting ready to take that picture of all of you, please also in the chat, you can maybe uh, just after this, write a small comment what you found most interesting uh, from, from this, from Karina. So uh, Varun, I see that we... Get more and more people on the webcams. And I see this amazing background from uh, Dubravko. That's amazing with the water behind you. <laughs> that is the tourist business there, yeah. And now we get more and more people here. I'll yes. give a minute to everyone to fix their yes. hair, to yeah. <laughs> you know, get ready for the photo. See that Ebert is doing his hair now. He's look perfect, Ebert. Yes. Uh, and remember, I have to get two two snaps because there's yeah. uh, two two windows. Snap us, please. <laughs> yes. Okay. Is everybody? Uh, okay. I'll give everyone just a minute. Yeah, just ten seconds. Then we're ready. <laughs> I'm just trying to see how to get all the people who are on the video on the first screen. So ah, got it. Very nice. So you got it now. Yes. 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 Are we all good to go? Yes, and please, all of you, write down your takeaways from uh, from this first session in the chat so we can see it. And then, Karina, thank you so much. And what we do now is we take a ten minute break. So when the time is uh, forty six, then we'll be back, uh, and then it's uh, ready for you, Bert. I know you take perfectly over here. Bit with the segmentation. So 10 minutes break for coffee, water, small walk. Thank you so much, Karina. Please write a message, all of you. What is your biggest takeaway from this lessons, this lesson with Karina? And please feel free to connect on LinkedIn if you like to. Please, uh, and ask please. questions if something arises, right? I will share your, your LinkedIn, or you can share your LinkedIn profile in the chat. So we feel yeah, welcome. Okay. Please do that. And then in 10 minutes, we're back here. There's a break now.
So we are just about to start that. We'll just give people a few minutes to come back, right? You hear me, Ben? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, yes. Uh, I think I'll just give them one more minute and I'll hope everybody comes back now. So we're ready. Uh, please, when you're back, then just write a short message in the, in the chat. And uh, then we know a little more that we are back or make a reaction, put up your hands, thumb, whatever. Clap, make an applause, <laughs> so we can see that you're back. Shall I start sharing my screen, Mats? Uh, yeah, you can do that. That's great. No. I see it now. You just have to start the presentation mode, and then it's running. Um... So hopefully everybody is coming back. Share a small message that you're back or raise your hand and say, I'm back here with a thumbs up or something else. People are coming now, that's great. So in, in a couple of minutes, I'll give the word, the word to you, Bert. But just before doing that, I'll summarize a little because uh, the first time I uh, heard about co-creation. I was uh, totally engaged and I really found that this is amazing and you can do co-creation everywhere with anybody and co-creation is the most amazing thing in the world. I also found out that certain circumstances uh, need to be uh, a part of this. And uh, when, when, when then I, after this, understood that you cannot do co-creation if you're not ready and if the client is not ready, then, uh, then it's difficult. Uh, and then after knowing a little more about that, I found out that um, one of the big issues here actually is an old school classical discipline from sales uh, doing segmentation. And uh, when I work with my clients, I found out very, very dramatically that segmentation is very, very often done from a very inside out perspective and not from an outside in. And what does I mean by that? Uh, I mean, actually, that when I ask my clients, how do you segment your customers? They tell me we have A, B, C, D or something like that. Okay. And then I ask them, what is the reason for your classification of A, B, C or D? Then uh, some of them tell me, we do it because A, customers, they buy for 100,000 US dollars a year, B is between 50 and 100, C is between 20 and 50, and D is below 20. So you look upon uh, the classification bound up to the, the money they spend with you every year. Yeah. You don't look at the potential. Oh, then some of them say, yeah, we actually also look at what we could call AA or AB or AC, meaning that we also look how much they, how much turnover we get. And then secondly, the potential, because we could imagine that a C client that doesn't spend so much with us actually have a great potential. So we need now also to define the potential part. And then I said, okay, that's great. So now you look at how much they spend with you and you look at the potential, but it's still all from inside to outside. You look at the client from your perspective. Try to look at it differently. Try to imagine that we could look at it the way that we understand the client. And maybe for those of you participating in my first webinar today, maybe we should understand the behavior of the client. Maybe we should understand the way that they travel on the customer journey then we'll be able to fulfill the classical segmentation that comes from having profit and taking market share. And when I met you, Bert, I really understood that segmentation in the classical old school way 
has no no way to do with segmentation. It's just a way of pushing, putting our customers into some boxes. And you learned me to see that in a different way. I'm really looking forward to you to do the same today. And it has a lot of perspectives to find out who we can do co-creation with. So please, Bert, take it away from here. I'm looking forward to that. To well, uh, thank, thank you very uh, much, uh, Matt. Uh, and uh, thank you a lot for this uh, great uh, compliment. Um, and um, I'm really happy that uh, I can share uh, my research uh, here with you uh, today. Uh, and as a and as you paved uh, or set the scene very well uh, for for uh, for my research and for this presentation, and so we really have to understand what uh, purchasers are actually doing. And so um, this is uh, what what you see here on this uh, first uh, slide uh, is actually the title of uh, of my dissertation: Salespeople are from Mars and uh, purchasers are from Venus. Uh, um, and it's uh, an uh, analogy of, uh, of this uh, famous book. Uh, so uh, men are from Mars and uh, women are from Venus. Uh, and in this book, what we uh, actually learned is that, okay, we have two, two uh, different type of uh, people, but if you want to have like a marriage, and to me, co-creation is actually a form of marriage, uh, we have to understand uh, the other side, uh, the, uh, the needs of the other person and how they actually operate uh, uh, to make it a success. And so that's why I chose uh, this uh, title for my dissertation and uh, I think it's still relevant uh, today. Uh, um, I already introduced myself uh, in the beginning of this workshop, so I won't repeat myself. Uh, but what I want to start with is actually uh, with the evolving buyer-seller relationships uh, uh, and we have two sides and so we have the relationship between the buyer and the seller and as already mentioned by uh, Karina and uh, Mats, uh, uh, we usually uh, adopt uh, a strong selling point of view we really care about what we want uh, and if i uh, do research with uh, sales managers these are some things that i hear often uh, returning in those conversations. And so first of all, we, uh, they're dealing with uh, demanding customers. They uh, also tell me competition is increasing. Uh, thirdly, it's so difficult to get first meeting. So just to get across uh, what we call gatekeepers is almost uh, unlikely. Uh, um, and the sales cycle time is getting longer. And so a sales cycle time, meaning between the first uh, potential uh, contact and closing the deal is becoming longer and longer. And um, if we combine this, we could uh, come up with some research questions, but this is not the point of today. But these uh, are some questions that are quite difficult to answer by most uh, sales managers. And uh, to guide you through a uh, potential uh, answer to uh, or to overcome these uh, difficulties in the sales landscape, I invite you to uh, to get like a, a closer look on what's happening with our buyers. And so, if you look at uh, the buyers' point of view, well, what they say is they don't want to talk to sales. And so, 53% of the buyers don't want to talk to sales, meaning never. Uh, and if they get information during uh, the sales, uh, to, during their buying process uh, from the sales side, they say it's actually not relevant and two thirds of the time, right? And to just get like a little bit in the head of the, of the buyer, uh, uh, they have responsibilities of up to 2000, 3000 items they need to purchase every day. And uh, if we make an analogy with our uh, everyday life, if we have to buy, let's say, uh, 200, 300 uh, different items uh, every year, uh, uh, we don't pay attention uh, in the uh, buying process as much for, uh, let's say, buying a car or for buying a can of uh, Coca-Cola, right? Um, and uh, what is uh, totally overlooked by the sales side is the need for buyers to reduce their risk exposure when they're actually purchasing, right? Now, this has a 
that's like uh, already like 15 years ago starting it uh, uh, the digitalization really disrupting uh, the sales point of view uh, uh, so what we have is okay we have digitalization um, and um, step by step we learned that salespeople who just share basic information or what we call a speaking brochure well they are no longer relevant they won't stand out and actually uh, they will have a very difficult time to uh, create value and to uh, well to close a, a profitable deal right and the reason for that is it's not that difficult to find so we have the internet to change the whole uh, purchasing process so here when i just uh, quickly search for a comparison of different crm systems it's so easy to find like all the possible information on potential suppliers and so i just found this comparison website for example captera uh, and i could just tell okay like i'm looking for this kind of crm system and I can just directly get in contact with uh, these suppliers, right? So in the past, what we would have is that the information that I would need in the first steps of my buying process are actually in the hands of salespeople. And this has changed. And so this has changed due to the uh, rise of uh, digitalization and access to information online, right? To really get into uh, the, the research, I, I want to guide you through two important questions. Now, the first one is how important is the customer for our company, right? So here, what we do is uh, we look into the our point of view. So we look at okay, this customer is interesting or not, and then we adapt our sales approaches accordingly. Now, in this example, so um, at the left-hand side, this is like the sales company and they sell uh, paper for printers and they, they sell it to our school, uh, to, to the business school uh, I'm working at, the yeah, ASIC uh, School of Management in Paris. So if I'm uh, Claire Alpha or uh, the, 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 um, Claire Fontaine, uh, the producer of this uh, paper, what I would see is if I make, as uh, introduced by Matt, uh, uh, an ABC analysis of my biggest customers, I would look at Yesek, my school, as an A customer. We use paper incredibly. We, we use pallets per day. We have 6,000 students, we have 200 professors, and we have 300 staff members. We use paper nonstop. So, for, for us, like as a selling company, we would look at uh, YESEC as a super important customer, right? And most likely we would base our segmentation based on this. We would have like similar type of uh, customers based on the consumption of paper. And then we would say, let's go for them. Let's, uh, let's put them in the most important uh, segment. And so the A kind of customer. Yeah? So if we have like a look at what are potential segment uh, segmentation criteria, well, here we have uh, uh, three different levels. So first of all, I will start with the two uh, bottom ones, uh, so the profile and the behavior. Uh, uh, and they're very easy to uh, implement, right? So if you look at uh, profile segmentation criteria, well, here we look at, okay, we segment based on industry, uh, geography so let's say like oh, just around uh, the area of Dubai so these are like the this segment and then a little bit further is like another segment and then if you go for uh, Latin America that's like a different segment uh, altogether or we just say okay if this company or potential customer or our customer has a number of employees well then uh, it becomes an A customer right now a level up we could also incorporate their behavior so to segment, we look at the behavior of our customers, meaning how much they buy, uh, how fast they're growing, how loyal they are, and how responsive they are to innovation. That's already pretty good. Now, what I want to introduce today is actually that we should focus on their needs. So really, as Karina introduced already, customer-centric. So if we look at what they want, 
and not what we want, we can go, we can go much further. Yeah? So here we have a product criticality to the buyer. How much does this buyer need this type of sales offer that we are selling to them? Right? We could look at uh, how much they are uh, centralized. How is their buying infrastructure? Really like looking deeper on their needs. Right? So this brings me to uh, a quick question. And uh, um, who of you uh, uh, has like a, some uh, feedback or like how do you usually approach your segmentation? Like if you just cut it into three um, uh, fields, uh, so three uh, types of criteria, would you say you uh, segment based on uh, elements of the profile criteria or more likely to uh, well, segment on the behavioral criteria or do you incorporate really how critical the product is, how they are uh, setting up their buying infrastructure uh, and so on following the needs criteria if i uh if you want uh you can just write it in the chat or uh unmute for a for a second uh, and then i can uh follow up on that So I can't see the chat. Can anyone share? A... I don't. Yeah, we we. I can give you some of the answers here. Oh, thanks. Because I, I can't open. Uh, maybe I'm using two screens and. Uh... <laughs> you got yeah, it? Okay. yeah. Somebody saying uh, B and C, some C, some B and C, some C. Uh, that means. So that's already pretty good. And so, yeah. um, and so what I hear most of the time uh, is that uh, the common sales approach or the common uh, segmentation approach is using like an ABC analysis based on sales. And so another example, this would be like the, the light bulbs that we use in our school. And uh, this kind of uh, selling company would look at us, okay, we have really two large uh, campuses all right, this is a major company. Uh, we will uh, approach them uh, as an uh, A customer and we would put uh, a lot of resources on that relationship, meaning we want to visit them like almost every two weeks. We want to co-create uh, with them. We want to co-innovate with them. Uh, and we really want to uh, get uh, as close as possible to them by having a lot of meetings uh, with uh, this uh, school. But now if I incorporate the second question, and so how important is our company for the customer? I think this is like an, um, a difficult question to, to uh, answer honestly, but if we are, uh, if we are Claire Fontaine and we really think well about how our school is evaluating the supplier of paper, Actually, to be fair, there's so many suppliers of uh, printer paper that um, that uh, Claire Fontaine is not that important. And this leads to some uh, popular uh, statistics. First of all, Forrester. So um, Forrester says 8% of buyers estimate that the meetings with uh, salespeople are useless. 85%. 85% of the buyers say like, well, this meeting should have been an email, right? Gardner says that uh, salespeople, uh, according to the buyer, salespeople can only use 17% of the buyer's time. So bringing us to an old question in uh, sales uh, research and in the sales domain, what is the role of a salesperson over the next coming years? And their main role should be focusing on customer centricity. And uh, customer centricity, let's break that down. In, uh, in businesses, 
what we see is that in uh, decision making units, so like the customer company, uh, we see like one uh, profile as a rising star. Uh, and this is the purchaser. So if you look at the purchaser, in the past, what would salespeople always try and do is try to bypass, try to avoid uh, this purchaser at any cost. Because these were annoying type of people. They were too much focused on the price. They had no sense for uh, value. So it was much easier to just go with uh, another stakeholder, maybe somebody in marketing, to close the deal. Now, what happened is, is that the purchaser has become a single point of contact in uh, many organizations. And if you try to avoid this purchaser in the future, I think it will backfire. I'm almost sure. And the reason why is uh, that the purchaser has become so uh, influential in a, in a buying company is because of the following reason. Like in uh, the last financial crisis or economic crisis, what we had is the basic equation of business rising as to its maximum importance. If you look at the basic, most basic uh, equation, we have profit, it's revenues minus cost. And it doesn't come as a surprise in terms of uh, global crisis that revenues are under pressure. They're dropping for most type of companies. And the only way that we can still keep on writing black numbers is by focusing on a cost. And here comes the rise of the purchaser. And I won't go too much into detail, but I found this interesting. This is just like an academic, boring background. But if you look at the last four global recessions since uh, World War II, uh, we have seen an incremental push every time after each global recession for the purchasing profile. And so in uh, 75, uh, um, they became more and more uh, and then 82, uh, they yeah. up. And we have a little bad, a little bad connection. Oh. Oh. Um. Uh, the, the sound gets a little uh, not so good. Uh, it seems like when you go too far from the computer, we lose a little. Is this better? Yes, yeah, sure. Oh, okay, thanks for, uh, for letting me know. Thanks a lot. So um, uh, I will just quickly recap. So like four uh, last global recessions had the purchasing side um, really uh, got a boost. Uh, uh, 82, the same again. And so first strategic role, nine to one uh, uh, strategic planning role. And then last uh, global crisis, uh, uh, they got an internal support from the organization. And here I'm very sensitive to that. Uh, uh, I don't know when we will have a next global uh, recession, uh, uh, but uh, it's likely that we will have one day a next uh, global recession. And uh, in my humble opinion, it will give you uh, it will give another boost to the uh, purchasing profile. And so maybe uh, after the Corona crisis hits the economy. Uh, maybe uh, later, but one day we will have another global uh, recession again. Okay, so we have purchasers becoming empowered. They have internal support. So other uh, members of the organization, they really support uh, uh, this purchasing function and they become so more strategic. Just a quick check, Mats. The sound is good now? The sound is good when you are close to the screen and keep pretty uh, still. Okay, I will stand still. <laughs> and so uh, what I want to introduce you is, okay, so we have the purchaser becoming really important. They have more responsibilities. They have become more strategic, but they are under a lot of pressure, time pressure. So how do they manage their day-to-day -day activities, right? Just a quick giveaway, they won't spend time with salespeople if they don't catch any value out of it. So if you look at how they actually organize their day-to-day -day activities, they prioritize uh, their meetings. They prioritize how much time they spend with different salespeople. 
And the way they use the, the way they do this categorization is by using the number one purchasing metric, and it's called the Krautic Purchasing Portfolio Matrix. And let me guide you through this matrix. It has been developed by Peter Kralczyk in 83, and it is the still today the most widely used purchasing matrix. This is how they operate. This is how they, uh, this is like the holy grail for any purchaser. Okay. So we have two axes. One is a relative profit impact axis. And so here we have, um, the impact a particular purchase has on the profitability of the firm. And so if they spend a lot of money, uh, then relatively speaking, uh, then uh, it has a higher impact on their profit. I really want to stress a relative profit impact. For Microsoft, it might be um, an expense of 50,000 euros. It won't have a large impact on their profits. If we look at uh, a startup having an expense of 50,000 euros, it will have a large impact on their profit. So it's uh, very simple. And I have a question here. There's somebody yes. asking, uh, given that each of the business function within a corporate are purchases, how do we define the purchase function separately? That means purchasing departments are only enablers and buy for their business owners. That is why increasingly we are seeing in actual sales process. You just see the point here, we have the buying senders, the influencers, the, the purchasers. Do we come back to that a little later? Uh, yes, I, well, I, I haven't, I don't have slides on it, but I would love no. to uh, take that question right away. Please. So if we have like those different profiles, and so actually there are the different uh, uh, roles uh, people might have in a company. So we call that the decision-making unit. The, the power is more and more in the hands of the purchaser. So in the end, not all these roles has, have the same level of influence on the final outcome of that decision. So it might be, and it's uh, developing pretty fast in that direction, is that uh, purchasers, they take up more of those roles of the decision-making unit. So they have to orchestrate this. And if they have to orchestrate this and they have to uh, coordinate it, then they have much more power in actually guiding uh, the actually the buying process. And, and, and Bert, you could maybe also uh, uh, elaborate a little on, on the matrix you have here. The, the purchaser position is totally different in some of them than in others, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, you come back, you go into that, I think. Yes. Yes, uh, I am. So. Um, I'm already happy that the voice, uh, that the sound is good. So that's, <laughs> that's uh, really important. And I will get to that. It could be for me a button like product, but uh, I, I will uh, tap on that uh, later. And so um, first axis profit impact. And then secondly, we have a supply risk uh, angle. Uh, and this means there are, to have a high supply risk, it means there are few suppliers available. And on top of that, at the same time, if we don't have the, the product or service and we don't correctly implement it, it would damage our business hard. It would have a very negative impact on our business. It might be that the production stops and that we lose customers, right? So it's significant uh, pain to our uh, business processes. So we might hit the news. All right, let's start with the first uh, type of product uh, uh, left, uh, left hand side at the bottom, we have non-critical products, low supply risk, low profit impact. An example here is taken from a bakery, a bakery who has like, let's say like this uh, nice flour at the counter desk. If they have the flour, fine. If they don't have it, it's also fine. So uh, it won't have an uh, impact on their uh, business process. They can still keep on uh, baking the bread. Uh, and it's just like a nice to have. And on top of that, it won't have an impact on their profitability or a very uh, minor one. So this flower would be, let's say like a 30 US dollars uh, to purchase. This has not a big influence on their profit, right? So later on, we will uh, use this basic framework to uh, uh, 
uh, look into what where co-creation comes in. Second type of product, a leverage product. Also flour, but written differently. And so the flour they actually need to bake the bread. So what we have is we have a lot of different suppliers who can uh, supply the bakery with this, uh, with this ingredient. Huh? But in the every day they're buying so much of this product. So they spend quite a lot of money on this, right? That's what we call a leverage product. Right? Now, if we look at the high supply risk type of products, we have a bottleneck product. And this could be, for example, yeast, but also maybe some um, specialty chemical that is necessary to produce uh, the bread, right? So they don't spend that much money on it, but it's essential for their business. And there are very few suppliers worldwide uh, that can actually uh, provide that product to them. And then finally, we have a strategic product. And so this would be, for example, like the uh, setup of their ovens. And um, this is where most selling companies think they are positioned, but actually they are not. Uh, uh, so to give a rough uh, indication, and so most of the in the non-critical products. So um, there's a lot of uh, different suppliers available. It doesn't kill their business if they don't have it. Uh, and relatively speaking, it's not that much of an impact on their profitability, right? Uh, so we have roughly 60-70% of the business uh, relationships in non-critical products. Right. Well, I, want I to... think one comment here, Berdy, is that uh, when, when you're the salesman, you think all the time that your product is extremely strategic important for the client. All the time you expect it. I see it from my point as a consultant. I think I'm the most important supplier they have. But very often I'm just a non-critical product, meaning that I really didn't position myself uh, in, in other ways. Yes, yes. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a food for thought. And so most selling companies uh, think they are seen as a high, highly strategic product. There is no uh, alternative. There is no competitor. Uh, the, this is like where uh, the, the buyer is like thrilled to, to know more about. And I, in the end, it's not. And let me uh, share like this example about the subjectiveness of how the buyer is actually categorizing your uh, offer. Let's have a simple example uh, with tires. If we look at tires, uh, so we have the one for non-critical products. This is the thing that we uh, use in our garden. If we have this tire, if this thing is working or not, well, the thing is, uh, if it works, great. If it barely works, okay. If it uh, and if we don't have it, we, we, we have it tomorrow. And so we just order it and then we replace it. It's fine, right? So we don't spend much money on it uh, as a company uh, in the example of a, a normal company who just has it somewhere in the, in the warehouse. Uh, um, secondly, for a tire, if we are in the situation of a transportation company, so here I count six, uh, 12 tires at this uh, truck. Uh, so what it is, is they know what they're buying. They really know what's similar to the bakery. They, this baker man knows the flour uh, that he or she is buying. And so uh, we, we know what they want. We have a little bit Bert. What did you say, Matt? Uh, we had a little bad connection, so so maybe. Oh, I'm take, sorry about that. Yeah, take the leverage product again, please. Oh, my, of course. And so here, if you look at the leverage product, so a transportation company, and so they have, uh, I I count here twelve tower tires at uh, every truck. So per year, it might be they buy hundreds of these tires, and they know what they're uh, looking for. So what they want to do here is really. Uh, uh, maximize their strong position uh, maybe they will send out the tender to buy the, the, the tires at the lowest cost as possible and they incorporate uh, the total cost of ownership concept I uh, think we have a question from Janne uh, Janne you have a question yes let me challenge you a bit so sort of for a 10 years for of the world, then for a smaller 
software company and now running a startup. And my experience actually is that that when buying things, there are I would say that three kind of key challenges. One is that it's quite easy to say that there are these and these kind of risks and these and these kind of challenges. But it's much more difficult for buyers to really assess potential. So that I've seen several times, and this is the other example, that I have come across several times the occasion that as part of the procurement process, there has been this kind of demand for 15% discount. But I have never come across with a procurement who is able to say that if we are paying you 10% more, can you increase the output with 10, 20%? Never come across with that. So, no. so and, and the third case is that we know for sure, and based on, on, for example, my own 15 years, 20 years in this business, I know that there are characteristics in many cases with the client that you are buying siloed point solution now, but then you will need this, that, and that. And it's almost impossible to actually educate, uh, especially those customers who are supported with a strong procurement department to really see over the box, uh, boxes, uh, walls. And, uh, and uh, it simply is really, really troubling and frustrating that we know for sure that eventually those problems will come up. But still, let's say once you are very fixed procurement process, it's quite difficult to see that sort of thing. So, so my point is that I've been involved with the procurement so many years. I know pretty much all the tricks and practices uh, come through with like a, my team has processed through something like one billion contracts worth one billion dollars. So I know pretty much all the tricks, but I seldom have that sort of, let's say, procurement approaches that are really positively surprising in a, in a creativeness. Lately, I've come across with few and it's promising, but it's still the big picture is quite depressing, I must say. Okay, so, well, so your uh, question, Janne, what was your question? Was it more common? Okay. The question is really that, that uh, how procurement could be more creative yeah. to bring more value to the customer uh, and, and get away from that sort of we are checking those 10 points and then we are checking those points and we cannot look around over those checkpoints and these boxes and these assignments. So how to be more creative in order to bring more value? Okay. Thank you very much for that question, uh, Jana. And so uh, in my uh, opinion, so uh, when I will start talking about the, the products that are categorized with a higher supply here they will have to become more creative. And so uh, I, uh, to, I liked your comment about I, that you never met um, like a purchaser who asked to pay more. Well, actually I have. And they are all uh, based in um, when they are buying um, products that are considered with a high supply risk. I even have an, a case and it was a big company when they uh, have uh, a purchase as a, for bottleneck products. They noticed that the supplier was not doing well in terms of uh, finances. And so they were not making a lot of profit. So what they even suggested is uh, workshops, first of all, to increase their profitability. And then if that didn't work, they suggested to pay them more. And the reason why that is, is because if they uh, have a supplier, uh, this is these are the strategic suppliers to them. If one of those goes bankrupt, they lose much more than initially paying a little bit more for the product. Because if one of those suppliers goes bankrupt, then, for example, for a special uh, chemical, then they are in pain. They have uh, they, the whole point, the, mo uh, the most important purchasing strategy for bottleneck products is actually securing supply. So here they don't negotiate pricing as crazy, or it's a, it's a not well organized purchasing team. Uh, so in this example, uh, this could be uh, these tires they used for airplanes. So if they negotiate way too tough and they they found uh, they find the cheapest supplier possible for these type of tires, it could be they have a bad landing, and this would backfire to the uh, airline company tremendously. 
And then finally, I have a strategic product example for tires. And this is actually uh, my father-in-law, who is a rally uh, pilot. The amount of money they spent and co-innovate on having the best tires for any type of track they are about to have, because here we have a lot of rain. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's hot, so we don't have like the nice weather you have in Dubai. And so uh, here, the amount of money and the price insensitivity for the tires is crazy. If one tire costs 2,000 euros, it's not a problem. And this is not the same when we look at uh, leverage products. So for this transportation company, they know what they want. They know exactly what kind of tires they are out there, and they want to reduce the total cost of owning these tires, maybe also replacing them, and so on. Storing them, uh, transportation, everything. Right? Uh, when I go back to the example of the rally driver, here, one better element of the tire, a mighty uh, difference, creates a competitive advantage. It could be on a one track, it generates half a second. And half a second is enough. Uh, half a second is, is worth a lot for a rally driver, right? And this is not the same for uh, the transportation company. Now, if you're uh, in the uh, selling and your offer is being seen as a bottleneck product, for example, here with the tires for the airplane, well, then we have to try to avoid the pain. And so we have to uh, have a sales message that is building on uh, the pain and avoiding the risk, securing the supply, having a secure product. And so for most of the company, uh, it's a non-critical product situation. We have to develop purchasing efficiency, right? So just to be very clear, and so where we start co-creating is when the supply risk is high. So for example, like the bakery, and so it could be an industrial bakery. Well, here they need to have the best type of oven, like operational excellence, like the best of the best because they need this thing to beat competition. They need those innovations from the supplier. But if they're buying flour, they know what they're buying. So they don't need to see salespeople every week just to take orders. That's reducing their efficiency. All right? Now, just a quick question to you. Uh, I can't take too much time on this one, uh, but just reflect on this question. So for what customers is your sales offer or its services? perceived as uh, non-critical, leverage, bottleneck, and strategic uh, product. And so as Matt invited you to, to draw uh, with a pen and, uh, and paper, uh, here I would quickly take over like this framework and really be critical uh, on your business relationships and think, okay, from their point of view, if, if you stand in their shoes, how do they look at us? How do they perceive our products? Are they really strategic to them? Are they really strategic products? Does, do we have very few competitors? Does it kill their uh, production process? Do they have to excuse themselves to, to their customers? Would they get, get like bad uh, press coverage if they don't have our product? Um, or are we really more into like, uh, like bigger uh, quantities not a pure commodity, but like more in, this, in the field of, of this uh, flour or uh, eggs uh, or milk uh, that is easily, uh, well, to, to compare with competitors and uh, it's more about a volume, all right? So I just leave that up to you. Just quickly think about that because we will go further on this where we will now add uh, uh, the aspect of, should we, uh, at our side, make it easier for the buyer increase their efficiency. And with the efficiency, what do we hear? We hear digital channels. And so, or do we have to intervene with our sales team, uh, personal selling? Now, if we combine this, this was another uh, research project. And so if we really want to quickly get to the answer, if we have high supply risks, we need to take the conversation to the salesperson as soon as possible. So what we do is we trigger 
an offline conversation. And I mean offline, meaning like a personal conversation. It could be through Zoom and definitely uh, with the uh, restrictions that we're having in France. I don't know how it is in Dubai. I think it's, it's much better uh, out there. Uh, uh, and uh, to be fair, I'm pretty jealous of that situation. Uh, um, but so if we know that the buyer looks at us, uh, that our product or service is a high supply risk, but then we need to meet as soon as possible. And why is that? They need to assess the trust. They need to assess how to implement this. And that's something we only can do by salespeople, right? Now, if there's a low supply risk, we have to make it as efficient as possible for the buyer. And here we use marketing automated sales, right? So we use, for example, um, web services. We let them buy through a platform. We let them buy through web forms, like as easy as possible, as whatever they want, right? Now, I have like uh, marked here, like some uh, uh, a line on the leverage products. So what I want to add here, maybe what needs to be assessed by the buyer, but only for the first time is the trustworthiness of the selling company. And so here we could have like one uh, meeting but not a recurrence every two weeks meeting just to take orders for flour or for egg yolks or for, for iron or for a, a basic uh, product that, or even the tires, they know what they are buying, right? Bert, I'd like to comment here because you see that one of the most important things for, for most B2B companies, even those who supply uh, some of the high supply risk is to make it easy for clients to reorder. You have uh, the first time you sell, uh, now we heard uh, Jana speak about uh, a bigger IT solution or system. Then mm -hmm. the first time it might be a strategic product, but the services you keep after, you, you buy afterwards, they might be uh, on, on low supply risk, meaning that you have to order them online or chat or, or some other functions because they don't want to wait for a salesman to, to arrive. I love that comment. Uh, and then the reason is, because if you look at uh, buying situations, sometimes, let's take the example of, of Microsoft, like our school, and they're paying a lot, or they're buying a lot of these uh, office uh, tools, uh, Outlook, Word, and so on. So it's pretty expensive. Uh, but that's more or less like a leverage product because they know what they're buying, it's a recurring business, done. But if they're looking for an IT infrastructure to, I don't know, like uh, our cloud uh, services, uh, teaching online, and so on, well, then they're looking at it as a strategic product. But that's something complicated because they're buying leverage products and strategic products from the same supplier. And that poses like the question or brings us to the question, well, how do salespeople uh, deal with that? And I think there should be uh, a nice balance in the sales meeting. Okay, yes, we tackle the leverage products, but where the value comes for, for my school or for the buyer is where we talk about the implementation of strategic products or services. And the leverage products, yes, we can talk about it and everything is fine, excellent, but we move on. So the, the value they take out of the meeting is where we as salespeople uh, talk about the, our know-how on how to implement these strategic products. And this is where they need us because the leverage products, they know what they're buying. So they, they don't need additional information on that. Right? So they want to reduce uh, the cost of uh, implementation uh, and maybe like even invoicing uh, with uh, that type of purchase. Just quickly uh, going through a set of examples. Uh, so non-critical uh, uh, product would buy office supplies. Usually that's considered as non-critical. Office Depot does it great. Uh, what they do is here, add it to your cart and you do it once, you add your credit, a company credit card, address, how it should be delivered, uh, where, and you name it, and uh, it goes as smooth as possible, right? So here we don't send salespeople. It's also too expensive to send salespeople to those customers, right? Because we think like, well, these pens and these, um, I don't know, batteries and so on, we, we don't care, like we just need it. And uh, if you do it, if Office Depot doesn't want to deliver, well, it's easy to find another one uh, who can, bring us these things, right? Uh, uh, having a history in uh, the restaurant business. So here, if the chef orders a, 
uh, vegetables and, uh, and other ingredients, uh, this is usually considered as a leverage product. Huge spend, a lot of money going through uh, the ingredients, uh, but there are a lot of suppliers available. So what they do is actually, uh, they, uh, at the end of the day, they, take, they send their order to their supplier. And if I look at uh, this uh, supplier, it's in Dutch, but I, I have the translation at the bottom. So what they do is they really understand the business of, or the needs of this uh, chef. They are so busy. They work 16, 17 hours every day. So having a salespeople coming, a salesperson coming over to take an order is reducing their efficiency. Actually, it's reducing their night's sleep. Uh, so what they do here is, okay, guys, we know your business. We know what you want. Uh, uh, just choose the way to communicate with us your order, and we will make sure you get it the same morning. So every order made before 7 in the morning, fax, apparently in Europe we still use it, uh, uh, email, phone, order form, whatever, we deliver it before, noon, uh, before the service starts. Right? So I think this is... An excellent example, a lot of money on the table, but they know what they want and they make it as efficient as possible to order. And, to... and as long as the price is reasonable, it's not a problem. Well, that's something I will uh, tap on later on as well. Okay. So for this type of products, we need to have like all the information uh, available. So the price, the, the size, the, the weight, the, the, the color, everything has to be there. So this is what we call the comprehensiveness of the information. So uh, look at uh, an Amazon uh, order. You can see the dimensions, you can see when it will be delivered, you can see everything. So you have like everything at the tips of your finger to make a decision. So it, you can assess if the price is, is uh, good or not. So you can just uh, get like an Excel from their website and you just click uh, whatever you, have 15 you want. minutes more, Bert. Then, okay, I have to go a little bit. So here, if you look at the bottleneck product, so uh, BASF, and uh, very, very, um, uh, well, bottleneck kind of product. And uh, so uh, how to implement this for the car industry. So what they do is, this is Actimet, contact us. And then finally, uh, so I think the second uh, best uh, uh, consulting firm in the world after Intense, uh, uh, for something they don't want to use. So try to just match what they uh, need and find a segment that is willing to pay for, let's say like artificial intelligence on those uh, truck tires, right? And then finally, choose your ideal co-creator co -creator customer wisely. Uh, uh, see this as one of your best friends. Uh, uh, if you do it with everyone, uh, uh, it will be very difficult to manage uh, and it won't generate the expected profits. Uh, as you had in mind. So I really want to thank you very much for having, uh, having me. Um, here are my uh, contact uh, details. Uh, and uh, again, uh, I'm open uh, for, uh, for taking questions. Yeah, any questions, uh, people around, bring it on, please, if you want to uh, have some answers from Bert. But I have one question for you then, because Karina had the, the situation with the, the laundry company and uh, they were trying actually to change their position because normally it's pretty low risk and it's uh, uh, pretty non-critical, meaning the way that uh, there are several companies that can do it. But when they change their approach to, to engage more, they actually, uh, the core product is still the laundry, but but besides that, they change a little, right? So that's actually like a choice a certain company can make. But before you really want to move to uh, to be seen as a strategic product, uh, it's it's kind of a, like the, the profits are there. If you stick to uh, being seen as a as average uh, product, as Karina said, like it's non-sexy uh, business. Uh, but uh, if you want to move towards uh, being seen as strategic product, make sure that these innovations uh, are uh, also, uh, that the customer is also paying for them in the end. So otherwise you're just reducing your profitability. 
Uh, so that's, that would be uh, my take on that. Uh, so yes, you can educate a customer to be seen as um, a higher uh, supply risk and, and that your offer has a higher supply risk. Uh, but in the end, uh, uh, make sure that uh, it pays off as well. Uh, if you just co-create, uh, it costs a lot of money, a lot of time. And in the end, it might be uh, going against their efficiency uh, needs but if you're looking at like the Michelin restaurants, and so they have higher uh, expectations, they really want to have the best of the best. So that's, that's, uh, that makes sense in that uh, perspective. Okay. Thank you so much, Pat. Uh, any questions or any comments, please uh, feel free to, to write in the chat what you took away from the session. And um, Karina, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Then uh, if you can put on your picture, Yes. Oh, you're yeah. there. Great. I, uh, I just want to, to, to sum up a little before we close in a minute. Uh, any comments from you, Karina, to, to, to Bert and related to the co-creation? No, I just, uh, I think uh, this was a great presentation as always. Um, I think it's very important as, as uh, to take away the fact that you can move around, you can take a very simple uh, non-critical product and put it in center of a co-creation process but you need to be able to uh but you need to choose who to do that with very particularly so i just want to support everything that was said and uh and 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 just go ahead and do it uh businesses that co-create with customers as part of one of their sales strategies are um are actually doing better than companies that are not doing co-creation as one of their sales strategies. So please start up doing it. And the, the way to do it is to try to establish one or two products within uh, the process of a year. Because once you learn the process and you, you know how to do it, then you can actually, uh, it becomes a way of doing business. And then it kind of takes on its own life. So just get started. That's really all I want to say. Thank you. Bert and Karina, thank you so much. First of all, I think um, what I learned from the, the two of you is very interesting because you can say I'm a traditional consultant taking, uh, taking your, your stuff out to people because what I like about you is that what you bring here is not just your opinion, it's actually science or at least research that you've done and you researched it. And I think that's so amazing. And I think that what, what I see working together with you is also a kind of a co-creation process or at least the value creation process where we can bring something to the table that is for the good of sales and that is for the good of customer and the relationship. And I think that's really interesting that we can bring that all of us together to make, let's say, the world a, a better place to buy your stuff. Because if we get better sales, we get better buying and then people are more happy and then the world will be a better place to live in. So I think it's a, it's a high purpose, but I think we, uh, we react that way anyway. So if no further questions, I see some comments coming that people really, thanks for this. And I'll do exactly the same, Bert. Thank you so much. I hope you will soon be able to get out in lovely Paris. And Karina, thank you. I hope you're thank well. Thank you very much. Northern, thank you. And I hope you're well in the northern part of Denmark. I hope to see you when I visit Denmark the next time. So. Varun, is there any comments from you or Kanika? Otherwise, we will sh uh, shut down this uh, this uh, session here. No, uh, Max, but I really wanted to say thank you to you, um, to Karina and to Bert. And thank you for the uh, participants. It's a bit late here in Dubai, but thank you so much for patiently uh, listening. And I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I'm looking forward to our next uh, uh, meeting tomorrow. Perfect. And just to let you know that as well here, Bert and Karina will send the presentation to me and we will make sure that we can distribute to all of you. Thank you so much and take care all of you around the world. See you later. Bye bye. Thank you very much as well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.